to the reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Once they find it. At that time, Mary got ready and, and hurried to, to a town in the hill of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's giving the baby greeting, the baby leaped in her room, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored at the mother of Oh, my Lord, should come to me. As soon as the sound of your baby re reading reached my ears, the baby in my room leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed in the Lord and, and would fulfill his promises to her. This is the reading of the Holy Gospel. probably noticed the bandage on my finger. What do you do now? I thought I might as well tell everybody at one time instead of <coughs> telling the story multiple times. Yes, I uh, did a number on my finger. Wednesday night late wife had already gone to bed. I was uh, working with a very sharp knife and allowed myself to be a little distracted. I went to set the knife down onto a table and I was looking in the wrong direction and as I moved it forward I uh, snagged the tip and my hand slid forward along the blade and I'm happy to say the knife was sharp. <laughs> it really didn't hurt much. It bled quite a good bit. I didn't want to stress my wife out. She was already asleep. So I uh, wrapped something around it real tight and mopped up the blood and figured it would probably heal in good time. But uh, by Friday, I realized that it was going to call for medical attention. I finally became convinced of that, so I went to the clinic here in town, and they didn't have anybody there who could deal with it, so they sent me to a medical clinic in Saskatoon. I saw Lori Dreger in the parking lot, <laughs> so I had to explain. <laughs> I got in, and after a short wait, uh, a very cheerful nurse about my age came to uh, help me with it, and she started uh, the preparation process, you know, peeling off the blood-soaked band-aids that I'd put on there and so forth. And then the doctor came in, and well, the nurse was uh, very cheerful. The doctor was obviously stressed. And she did everything she could. I saw her trying her very best to cheer him up. Really, she was. And she said to him, what do you want? And he said, I want a new life. But then he went to work on me, and as we talked a little bit, uh, he seemed to mellow out and de-stress a little. When he was finishing up, uh, six stitches. I, uh, I said, about that uh, new life you wanted. <laughs> I said, uh, the only one I know who ever promised a new life is Jesus. And he kind of stopped for a moment. And then he said, do you think Jesus is the best way? <laughs> And I said, yes, Jesus is the best. And he didn't say anything more, and he, and he walked out. And the nurse finished doing the bandage, and I was just getting ready to leave, and the doctor walked back into the room, and he said, thank you for that word. And he said, actually, that was more than a word. And he turned and uh, walked out again. 
I'm not sure what that seed may accomplish in his life, but I knew that God prompted me to say what I said, and I believe that it fell on a willing heart. So you can pray for the doc. I don't even know his name. People will tell you that having inner peace is the result of having a strong faith in God. What would you think if I told you that God's faith in you is far stronger than your faith in God? Every morning that you are around to see the sunrise, that's a sign that God believes in you. He has given you one more day because he believes that the world needs you and that your task here is still unfinished. You say that you believe in Jesus, but do you believe that Jesus is working in and through you? If you have trusted in Jesus as Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ lives in you. If Christ is in you, of course God believes in you. Just like Elizabeth in our Gospel reading, you can be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Now for many people, the Christmas season is a stressful time. There's the, uh, the pressure of uh, getting ready for company, preparing the house, preparing the food, doing the, the essentials around home, and then you've got to do the shopping, and it's especially stressful if you forget your shopping bags. <laughs> <laughs> but some people have far more difficult things to handle at this season. People going through a Christmas period for the first time without a loved one. People who have suffered loss of one kind or another. A separation. A divorce family that doesn't get along, maybe doesn't even contact one another. The suicide rate at the Christmas season is higher than at any other time of year. If you're going to listen to the negative voices around you, you can get pretty down about things. In fact, you don't even want to listen to the negative self-talk that goes on in your mind. Instead, Psalm 85 and 8 says, I will listen to what the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints. Now, there's only two kinds of people in the world, the saints and the ain'ts. <laughs> we tend to think of saints as people who are very holy and very dead. But when the Bible talks about saints, it talks about people who are not always as holy as they should be in their living, and they're very much alive. A saint is made holy because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. His righteousness, His holiness, is imparted to us. And so He sees us, God sees us, through the lens of Jesus Christ as saints, as holy ones. That's pretty impressive. And God promises peace to His people. His saints. Micah chapter 5 is a prophecy of a coming Messiah. The one who is Emmanuel. God with us. Micah didn't know the name of the Messiah. But he is writing about Jesus. Hundreds of years before his birth. And what does he say about Jesus? He says, Micah 5, 5. And he will be their peace. If you know Jesus, you know peace. If you have no Jesus, you have no peace. 
You either leave your worries with God, or your worries will cause you to leave God. I was reading this week uh, a book by Ann Voskamp called A Broken Way. And in there she referred to a study that was done at Yale University that revealed that the best way to deal with stress is to do a small act of generosity for someone else. Now, the bottom line in this study was that when we are stressed and we help others, we end up helping ourselves. In the study, 77 adults were asked to record three things each day for several weeks. They were asked to record any and all stressful events. Some of you would find it stressful to record all those events. <laughs> they were also asked to record any and all helpful acts that they performed, such as opening a door, uh, helping a child, or whatever. And they were to record any time that they loaned something to someone else. What they found was that people who did more helpful things after stressful things actually de-stress. The bottom line was this, helpful behaviors buffer the effects of stress, according to the white coat at Yale University. And when I thought about it, I realized that this has been true in my own experience. This has been a year in which my wife and I have experienced a number of stress-inducing events. In June, Ruth was diagnosed with a potentially fatal heart condition that required a life-saving surgery that took place in October in Edmonton. People kept checking in on us, and we were loved through that time and prayed for like crazy. But people kept expecting me to be more stressed out about it than I was. Around that same time that she was diagnosed, I collided with a deer while riding a motorcycle, crashed and burned. The gas in the tank got all over me and caught on fire. And you know when you get on fire, you're supposed to stop, drop, and roll? Well, I'd already stopped, dropped, and rolled into the ditch, so I just kept rolling. <laughs> and uh, I ended up with uh, a bit of injury, four broken hands, and the four broken bones, pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, sometimes I have trouble talking. <laughs> and we've seen some challenges, for sure, in the lives of our kids and our grandkids. But through all of it, I have not felt particularly stressed. I've just kept on helping others as best I knew at every God-given opportunity. And I do believe that that has been a major de-stressor. I'm not bragging when I say this. I just want to make the point that based on my own experience, it works. When you... Now... This is the way I encapsulated this whole point. I wrote it in my journal. You might want to write it down, because this is the key. Ready? Here it comes. The big idea for the morning. When you bless, you get less stress. Let's try that together. When you bless, you get less stress. That's pretty good. One more time. When you bless, you get less stress. Try it. You'll like it. When you allow the love of God to flow through you to others, you experience His peace. You say you want to experience more of God's love and peace? The only way to get more is to give it away. Let me illustrate. I got up this morning, and uh, as I do practically every morning, I uh, brewed a real good, strong coffee in my French press. And then I took my, my cup, my Contigo cup, and I filled it as full as I could with that good coffee. Which, incidentally, 
I just thought I should share this with you. It just reminded me at the moment. The coffee that I made this morning was brewed from beans that were roasted by a Mennonite fellow down at Swanson and were graciously given to me by Desiree. She connected me with that guy in the first place. Anyway, once that cup was full, I may have wanted more coffee, but the only way I could get more coffee into that cup was to pour some out, right? Drink it. Once you're full, the only way to get more is to let it flow through. There's a spiritual principle here. When you sacrifice something, you get more of it. Give love, you get more love. Give peace, you get more peace. The Holy Spirit of God is within you. If you try to hold back the Holy Spirit, you will become stagnant. You say that you believe in God, and that's a great start. But I want you to leave church today believing that God will work in and through you. So you know how Peter saw Jesus walking on the water, and he wanted to be like Jesus, and he wanted to walk on the water too? You remember that story? So Jesus told him that he could do it. So he got out of the boat, and he walked on the water. But then he looked at the waves, and he began to doubt. And when he began to doubt, he began to sink. So, question. Who did Peter not believe in? Himself. Himself, somebody said. Do you get it? Peter didn't doubt Jesus in that sinking moment. Jesus was standing on the waves right in front of him. Peter believed in him enough to cry out to him to save him when he started to sing. Maybe what Peter had trouble believing was that Jesus believed in him. Can you believe in God in Jesus the way Jesus believes in you? Can you believe that Jesus believes in you enough to choose you? That's what he said. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. That's Bible. When you begin living as if Jesus believes in you, you experience the abundant life that Jesus offers. The cross that I wear is a sign of my belief. The cross at the front of our sanctuary is a sign of our shared belief. Jesus knows that he can fill us with his spirit. If he believes that he can fill us and use us, how can we not believe it? The cross is a sign that God is reaching out for us, that he would stop at nothing to save us, that he believes in us, loving us, and making all things. Do you believe that God can do his greatest work through ordinary people like us? Do you believe that God can do his greatest work through you? If you say, oh no, he couldn't do it through me, that might sound humble to other people, but it's actually disrespecting God. You're saying, he's not big enough, he's not great enough to use somebody like me. Well, he is. He is great enough. And he will fill you and use you. And as you allow his Holy Spirit to flow through you, to bless other people, you will experience his peace. As we come to our prayer now, I'm going to invite you. If 
you believe that Jesus can use you, if you're willing to allow His Holy Spirit to flow through you, to touch others with His love and peace, would you join me in just raising your hand? It's a big one. I know it. It's a challenge for all of us. It's a challenge to believe. Jesus said, do you believe that I can do this? The man said, Lord, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. And he did. Jesus did help him. And Jesus did work a miracle. We pray. Father God, give us grace to believe that you can work through people like us. Holy Spirit of God, thank you that as we approach this Christmas, you want to work through us to bless others. And as we do, we will experience your transcending peace. Jesus, we want more of you. We want more, and we know that the only way to get more is to allow you to keep on flowing through us. You can use us every day and every hour. In Jesus' name. Thank <laughs> you.